Well, good afternoon. If you'll give us one second, we are working on going live on Facebook. We are so excited uh, to have, oops, sorry about that. I shared it to the wrong place. We're going to have to redo that. Hang in with us, y'all. We're going to um, get started here. My name is Caroline Durham. I'm the legal and policy director for Georgia Appleseed. And we are so excited that you have joined us this middle of the day uh, for a remarkable panel of experts who are going to talk with you about overcoming uh, the barriers and challenges to school reengagement. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping pieces I just want to share with you. First of all, uh, we are uh, live on Facebook, so if you have friends who want to join and maybe didn't register via Zoom, um, you can let them know that the Georgia Appleseed Facebook page and the Truancy Intervention Project are also uh, streaming this uh, live. A couple of other things. If you're not familiar with Zoom, uh, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll see View. That will allow you to choose to see the whole gallery of panelists at one time, or you can choose the speaker view, which will let you see whoever's speaking uh, at the time. Um, we will be taking questions and answers. For those of you he here on Zoom with us, you can post them in the chat and send them to the panelists or utilize the Q&A function. Again, those are at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook, we have our remarkable team from both the Truancy Intervention Project and Georgia Appleseed there to watch for your questions so they can be lifted up into this remarkable discussion we're going to have today. I want to make a special invitation to our educators in the audience, particularly our superintendents and principals. Some of these issues are going to be talking about how you are all getting ready for reopening uh, this second school year during the pandemic. If you're interested in popping in as a panelist view, uh, please uh, send me a message or post it in the chat or the Q&A, and we'll see about doing that. We have a remarkable group of panelists. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah Babcock, uh, Deputy Director for the Truancy Intervention Project, who will take us forward into this great afternoon. Sarah? Thank you, Caroline, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. We are really excited um, to have the second in our series of school reopening panels um, and what we know is going to be a fantastic discussion today on making sure that we get all of our students fully engaged um, in the coming school year. Uh, as Caroline said, I'm the Deputy Director of the Truancy Intervention Project. Um, TIP works in partnership with the Fulton County Juvenile Court, Fulton County Schools, and Atlanta Public Schools to promote school attendance, prevent truancy, and offer interventions when um, students' attendance has begun to become an issue. And so I'm gonna briefly introduce our panelists um, and then turn it over to my co-moderator for some housekeeping, and then we will get into the meat of the panel, um, including allowing each of the panelists to say a little bit more about themselves. Um, so with us today, we have Jennifer Cardenas, who is the SEEKS program manager and coach. Sydney Royce, MSW, who is the Early Intervention Coordinator at Truancy Intervention Project. Dr. Karen Schwartz, who is a school social worker in Cobb County School District. And last but not least, Robin Wright, White, excuse me, Robin White, who is the Georgia Parent Advisory Council member and a nonprofit consultant. Um, and I will now turn it over to my co-moderator, LaShonda Woods Roberts, who is a staff attorney at Georgia Appleseed. All right, I'm so glad to be here with everyone. So glad you have joined us on today so we can have this great discussion on overcoming some of these barriers and challenges that our families and students are experiencing. Um, so before we get into additional housekeeping, I did want to remind those or introduce to those who weren't aware our third event in our reopening school series, um, which is on September 2nd. And that's gonna be recovering from learning loss, available supports for recovery and success. We do want to alert you to the fact that we know that there is some concern around learning loss, and we just want to address the lack of access or restricted access for those students who need it more during those pandemic and school closures. Um, so we hope that you would join us. We have the registration link here. Please notate it, or you can email us on the email I'm about to give you in just a minute um, so that we can send you the link directly. So we hope again that you will join us on September 2nd from 6 to 7.30 p.m. for our discussion on those available supports and services that your child can tap into to make sure that they're learning to their highest potential upon reopening and engaging. 
All right, so we got to ask for those in the audience, particularly those Fulton County residents. Um, at Georgia Appleseed, we partner a lot with the Fulton County CSP program to make sure that we're able to offer programs like the one today. In order for us to continue partnering with Fulton County CSP, we have to confirm the attendance of Fulton County residents. For those of you who registered through our Zoom link, you were able to provide us that information that we need. But for those viewing from Facebook, we have an ask for you especially. If possible, can you please email us your name and your home address to info at gaappleseed.org. Again, that's info at gaappleseed.org. It will help us tremendously. We wanna keep on bringing folks together and being able to pour into Fulton County and make sure those stakeholders are supported. And we need your help in doing that. And we thank you in advance. Now, as Caroline said, we wanna make this very engaging. We wanna make sure that we're sharing information, particularly for those schools and district leaders who can use it to make sure that it's a more comfortable and inviting environment for these kids who have probably not been to school for, I think, what, almost 18 months or so for some of them. So we want to make sure that we're engaging. So please, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. If you don't want to use that feature, feel free to chat myself or other members of the panel so that we can make sure your question is answered. It's very important that we hear from our constituents. We want to know how we're doing in these efforts. So if you can afterwards, please, please, please complete our post webinar survey. We have the link here. And if you email me at info at gaappleseed.org and send us your email, we'll make sure that you get a link to this survey and all of the resources going out after this discussion. So we are looking forward to an awesome discussion. So I am going to stop sharing now and we're going to jump right into it. I'm going to hand it back over to Sarah. Thanks, LaShonda. Um, so first, we'd like to give each of our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves with a little bit more detail, maybe talk about um, their background and their role, um, and then also share what you and or your organization are doing um, to prepare for this upcoming school year. And I'll just go in alphabetical order like we did before by last name. So Jen, if you'll kick us off. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jen Cardenas. I am program manager and lead implementation coach for SEEKS, which is social emotional engagement, knowledge and skills. Um, I have my background in dispute resolution, conflict management, and over 20 years of professional experience supporting at risk youth, their families, and the communities in which they live. Currently, um, we are offering professional learning and providing support to educators who are returning to the classroom this year to help them have the tips and tricks and tools and information they need to re-engage their students um, on the backside of the pandemic. Thank you. Sydney? Hi there. I'm Sydney Royce. I am the um, Early Intervention Program Coordinator for the Truancy Intervention Project. So I lead our prevention services efforts in our elementary schools in Fulton and um, APS, Atlanta Public Schools. Um, we are primarily a volunteer-based advocacy organization. So one of the main things that we've been gearing up for as we get ready to go back into the school or is, is reaching out to our volunteers, re-engaging them, making sure that they're prepared to kind of hit the ground running. We have been um, in communication with the schools that we work in, and we know that this is going to be a much different school year and that the kids are going to really need um, volunteers and people that are in their corner that can help them ex assess the, um, access these services and resources they're going to need to be um, successful this school year. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a social worker. I'm an MSW. Um, I'm an Atlanta native, so I do consider it like an honor and a privilege to be able to work in the community in which I grew up in. Um, I've been doing social work for close to 25 years. I've been working with children and family here in Atlanta for over a decade. Great. Thank you. Karen? Hi, I'm Karen Schwartz. I serve as a school social worker in Cobb County Schools. I've worked at um, probably about 10 or 15 different schools in this district over the past um, about 17 years. I've also worked as a clinical social worker and done private practice with children and adolescents. Um, and so one of the things that we're doing here in Cobb County to really focus on that re-engagement piece is to look at how we can enhance trainings, just like Jen had mentioned too, to staff. 
as well as to parents to help them understand some of the transition and some of the difficulties their, their children may face, how parents can model um, for them and things like that. I know we're gonna get into a little bit later, but those are some of the things that we as the social work department are really focusing on how we can reach out to the community, collaborate with agencies, provide trainings ourselves, and um, get resources together for families um, as we see these needs continue through the pandemic is not over. So still have a lot of work to do. Absolutely. And Robin? Hi, um, I'm a nonprofit consultant, but I also work with the Georgia Parent Advisory Council that's partnered with the Division of Family and Children's Services just to discuss best practices for families and how we are engaging with families. I also am currently working with the Children's Trust Fund Alliance, where we are creating a partnership right now where we are trying to get resource centers inside public schools that offer more resources, whether it be public benefits to housing assistance to all these other places so that we're creating these hybrid offices to give these social workers a little bit more opportunity and break, also giving teachers more access to be able to engage and also to try to increase parents' participation at school and bringing parents more into the school. Um, I'm also working uh, on the sustainability for the Georgia After School Alliance for the state of Georgia, where we're building more sustainability into after school programming. Thank you all for sharing um, some of the work you're doing and how you're helping ramp up for this reopening series, well, this reopening season, rather, um, that our kids and our teachers and stakeholders are experiencing. And so, with these discussions, right, we just had our town hall on social justice last Thursday evening, and we're bringing in stakeholders to make sure that the questions we ask are meaningful and effective in helping get some information out to the community. And one thing that is always going to come up is what are schools and districts doing to make sure those who are returning in person are safe? Can y'all speak to um, some of the precautions and safety measures that your district or districts that your organizations work with um, are doing to make sure that folks are number one comfortable and are safe when they get back in the building. So I will direct this to everybody, but maybe we can start with you, Karen. Sure, I know um, it's an ever evolving process. And I think y'all were just mentioning that there might be a website that WSB is doing to update the mass protocols for every district that seems to be changing in real time. Um, so, you know, as, as we look at all these regulations that keep changing, it is a challenge for the districts to stay up on that. But some of the best practices that I'm hearing going on, and I know we have going on here in Cobb County, are the social distancing when possible. It is, you know, three feet at minimum, trying to keep it at six, keeping kids kind of clustered together in pods, so contact tracing, which will be going on everywhere, um, can still happen. Um, and then as well as, you know, hand washing, you know, stations and sanitizing stations pretty much everywhere. Um, encouraging mask wearing, you know, it, some districts are requiring it and some are, are encouraging it. Um, but it is a challenge and I think that's one of the things that as um, the Delta variant, you know, ramps up and the different issues that we're facing ramp up, um, you know, school districts are trying the best they can in real time. I, I believe through most of either the CARES or the ARP funding that they're doing uh, virtual options. Um, available so parents can choose that option for their families if they feel like that is what's the best fit. So, um, and it's a three-year plan. I think that they need to, the school districts need to be offering virtual, um, knowing that this is something that's that's kind of a process that's not just an overnight fix. So that's kind of where Cobb is and, and what I'm hearing locally around the, the Atlanta metro area. Yeah, just to, um that's exactly what we're seeing in Fulton County and APS too. The well, APS is mandated wearing masks in the building for all students and staff and faculty from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. And they're gonna try to social distance as much as possible when they can, you know, pod the children up, hand washing, hand sanitizing, reinforcing those things. Fulton County isn't um, under a, a mask mandate, but they are strongly recommending masks while in the building. And they too are following the same um, uh, cleaning and safety and distancing protocols that uh, Karen mentioned too. So. I'm also in Fulton County and that's what it is, a mandatory mask. But one thing I would like to propose as a parent, as a possibility is how are we implementing infectious disease education in the curriculum to the children? 
Do you know what I mean? Because this is a new normal for us. We're not going to go back to, you know, we are, we're all starting to learn that this, this is something that we're just going to be adverse in forever. So if that's the case, then how are we implementing that in the curriculum at every level, even from kindergarten all the way to high school of studying how to do infectious disease prevention? What are the ways that, how do we teach our children how to protect themselves? Absolutely. To piggyback on that, um, I have been working in DeKalb County this week, and I know that they have mandated masks. Um, not only is it the school's responsibility to try and teach our kids how to stay safe, but I'd also just like to reinforce that it's the parent caregiver responsibility as well. Um, and that goes all the way from regular caregivers to after school programs, et cetera. To the best of our ability, we need to model good practices, teach those good practices, and be mindful that what we say and what we do as the adults are, is going to be mirrored by our children. So if we are reinforcing about the fact that masks are important to keep everybody safe um, because it is mandated in your school, it is going to be important that as the parent, caregiver, other adult in a child's life, that you keep that tone of this is what we have to do. I understand that this is a very um, driven issue. There's lots of emotion behind it, but we need to be mindful that our kids are the ones who are in the classroom facing this every day. And so they are going to mirror what we do and we need to model what is expected. Practicing mask wearing at home, reinforcing those positive hand washing behaviors, all of those things can help ease our children back into the classroom environment in these constantly changing times. Thank you, everyone. Um, so sort of turning to another topic that I think came up a lot as the panel was discussing getting ready for this. Um, and so we wanted to put front and center, um, you know, over the past 18 months since, um, you know, the first closures began happening in March of last year, um, it's probably safe to say that everyone, parents, teachers, administrators, students, um, everyone has experienced some form of trauma, whether big T trauma, little T trauma, some form of trauma has occurred over the past year. Um, and so how can schools and districts and educators prepare for some of the mental health and mental wellness needs um, that students and families are going to have as, as we return to sort of full-fledged in-person learning? Um, and how can they help resources get to the folks who are going to need them? And that is, is open to whoever wants to take that first. Um, so I'd like to just go ahead and jump in on this a little bit. Uh, one of the things that we say as we're talking to teachers and educators, administrators right now is we learn the geology after the earthquake. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson actually said that. And we have all, to your point, Sarah, we've all experienced a bit of an earthquake. Um, this one-two punch of COVID-19, the pandemic shutting down, and then the social justice issues that have come up have really collided to create something that is called collective trauma. Um, and that collective trauma impacts everybody, whether it's a personal direct impact or something that is happening because of a situation in the community. Recognizing that the way this trauma is impacting us has to do with the social loss first and foremost is going to be really important. Um, our students, we are not hopefully not going to get to the point where we have a massive mental health ep epidemic or crisis if we can recognize that our kids need to be re-socialized we as adults need to re-socialize we can really practice true upstream prevention if we focus on we know where the kids are jumping in right now we know where everybody's jumping in We've, we've got this situation that we've all just been through and are continuing to go through. So how can we support pro-social behaviors and resilience factors in our kiddos to avoid a downstream crisis that requires intervention or crisis management? I can jump right into that question as well, too. And I'm so glad that we talked about this um, just because I've been such an advocate for that social emotional learning. I know in public schools, it sometimes takes a back burner just because of all the other things that public schools have to address. But at this point, it's kind of forcing us to kind of push it forward, but not just putting it in there, but actually building skills around it. Are there breathing exercises? How are we teaching them to process their their emotions, to speak about their emotions. How are we getting them to communicate more in this space? Discussing the trauma, healthy ways to discuss the trauma. Also, teachers need education and training on how to address trauma. 
that's a big deal too because that isn't an easy thing and then also their versions of self-care will have to be taken care of because if they're not at 100 percent, they can't give this and this is going to be a heavy lift for our communities yeah, just to piggyback off what you were saying, Robin, I completely agree with that. I mean, the thing we have to think about, too, is that, like, our teachers are the first ones that are going to see these behaviors in the classroom, so they have to be really well-informed of what this type of behavior could look like, and we can't automatically go to a discipline mode, right? We've got to go, well, what's going on with this kid? We've got to look at it from that trauma-informed lens that we talk about, and also give them the, the lens to see it and then the knowledge to how to respond to it appropriately. So, yeah, I agree. It's going to be, it's going to be education, and it's going to be a collective collaborative effort to make sure the kids who need the resources and the services get them. And I'm going to apologize because you might hear the fire alarm going off and it has been going off since before you asked this question, which is why I had not jumped in until now. How distracting is that? Are y'all able to, I, I'm so sorry. Um, I, I never had it go on this long. Um, I just, again, you guys have made some really great points. I think the thing that we need to figure out is how to reach people where they're at. I think that, um, you know, we, we look at how can we do more podcasts? How can we do more online trainings? How can we do on-demand training so we can find people? Um, at, and that's where the virtual world has been helpful to be able to access these kind of Zoom calls and, and things like that to help um, I know we have a lot more parent participation in things because of the ability to reach people um, in their homes a lot of times than we might have otherwise. So I, I do think that um, you know, using things like mental wellness instead of mental health, you know, trying to approach it from a wellness standpoint and that proactive standpoint to destigmatize it as much as possible. You know, Simone Biles has been in the news obviously a lot with her own um, challenges and how she's, you know, addressed that I think is really, is really good um, for people to hear and see that it's not a problem and it's not a bad thing. And if you need help and you need to step back, how do you go about finding those resources and, and what do you need to do for that self-care? So the ways that we can reach people in the best ways possible are to, to find them where they are and, and get those resources in place. And I apologize, I'm talking fast. I just am hoping this isn't too distracting, the fire alarm. And so with that, I think it's important for all of us to notate and re remind those listening that mental wellness and men mental health are not equivalent to mental illness. That fire alarm is a signal of this cautionary tale to prevent this from turning into a mental health epidemic or pandemic of some sort because we did not prevent or intervene early to try to prevent it from worsening. So for those administrators and school leaders who are gonna be like, we don't have time for that. Our kids' scores are low. They have this huge perceived learning loss. We just don't have room and space for social emotional learning and, and mental wellness. What is that right now when we need to make sure these scores are where they need to be? They still have standardized testing. What do you say to those leaders in those schools about that social capital or the capital that's in social connections? What do you say to them when they push against social emotional learning? What do you say? You cannot have academic learning if that social emotional component is not there. If our kids are not engaged and connected, then nothing that is provided to them from an academic or instructional perspective is going to stick. What has happened over the course of the last year is that a wet blanket has literally been put on our kiddos hippocampus, which prevents them from being able to actively learn. Relationships are at the center of everything we as humans do, and those relationships have often been interrupted or ended. And so in order for us to get our kids to learn, we have to connect with them. That relationship is necessary. There is literally nothing that our kids cannot find out from Google, Alexa, or Siri, and I say this all the time. At the end of the day, what's important is that we are letting them know, I see you, I recognize you, and it's important to me that you're here. That's the first and foremost thing. The second piece is really recognizing that it's not enough to just have compliant kids. They have to be engaged. So some of those, those kiddos that we probably are not always thinking about in quote unquote normal times, but that really do need that support and attention are the quiet ones. They were the kids who are just compliant. We've got to go beyond that into building those relationships because a kid may not care about learning algebra too, but if they have respect or a relationship with their teacher, 
that's going to be what drives them to stay invested, to be independent, to continue to engage with their education and with the opportunities that are available to them. Just to piggyback on that, uh, I say to those individuals who are against social emotional learning, good luck. I wish you luck on your school year, primarily because when it's time to do skills measurement exams and your results, which uh, sometimes we can be a little bit result, you know, so hungry for those positive results and the elevations with students. If we don't take care of their emotional spectrums, we're not going to get educationally where we need to go. So it's going it's gonna to come on your doorstep whether you choose to deal with it or not. So actually having a solution for it is the best is the best choice. And, you know, I think that the relationship piece cannot be emphasized enough. I think that, um, you know, the more that we see those relationships with the, our families, with our teachers and our, our, our students, the more we're going to see that engagement, the more that we're going to, the kids are going to feel that, that social emotional support from you without even realizing that you've done anything different just by forming that relationship with them. I think there's a lot of data also to support the um, impact of, you know, social emotional well-being on academics. So, you know, if you are in a position where you're feeling like your school isn't recognizing that and, and understanding that, then there's a lot of data out there that you can easily find that shows that this, this is actually a very real thing. You cannot learn math, you cannot concentrate, you cannot focus if you're worried about when's your next meal coming, are your utilities going to be shut off, is mom okay? Did you know? Did something happen to her last night? I didn't see her come home. You know, all of these different things that the pandemic has exacerbated for a lot of our families um, are still there, and and even worse sometimes. So, you know, sometimes I think we forget as as adults that we were children too, and it, it is hard to know that. Wow, I couldn't have learned in that situation either. And I think sometimes just taking that step back to realize this is we are human, and and these struggles are real. And how can then, how would we want to be treated in that situation? How would we want to be addressed in that situation? So I think those are all key pieces to sometimes we forget everybody has a story and we have our own stories. And, and how would we want to be responded to, I think, is a really key piece um, as educators. I wanted to add one more thing to what Dr. Schwartz was saying also, and that's that social emotional learning doesn't have to be a curriculum or a thing or an add on. It can be something as simple as just noticing where your students are, if they are engaged or not engaged, are we moving beyond compliance? And then how can we get into that active participation and learning in our classrooms, in our hallways, in our wherever the environment might be where learning occurs. So I think a lot of times what I hear is there's just, it's too much money, it's too much time. It doesn't have to be an add-on. It doesn't have to cost anything. It can literally just be noticing and appreciating and then looking at what's working to support continued growth and engagement and, and social resilience. Thank you all. Um, so sort of continuing on this mental wellness um, discussion and point, um, we know that of the many traumas experienced in the last year, we think about deaths from COVID-19, um, the stress that virtual learning caused for parents and maybe also for students, the financial impact of the pandemic, um, and then of course the murder of George Floyd and all that came from that, all of those traumas um, disproportionately impacted low income and African American, Black and Hispanic communities. Um, and so knowing that those students may be coming into school with sort of complex or interrelated trauma, what can schools and educators do to take sort of the discussion we've just had around mental wellness and really elevate it to reach those children in particular? So, you know, what have you all seen and what suggestions would you have? I'm going to throw this to Sydney first, if that's okay, because I know that she works directly with that population um, and then obviously would love to hear from everyone else. Well, we've been having some dialogues with the schools and the educators in those particular schools and those communities. And I will say that there is an awareness that they're that the kids are going to come back into the building and there's going to be a need for extra support. So with that being said, I mean, it's really going to be, it's going to be about connecti 
connectivity. It's going to be about communication. It's really going to be about meeting these families, these students exactly where they are to like look at their um, their behaviors, their activities through a trauma focused lens and really be willing to, you know, peel back the different layers on the onion and really dig deep to see if you can help meet these needs. But I do think that um, the, the schools that we work with, they, they know these, these families have been relatively vocal. They have, they, have, they have shared their experiences. They know that there's been multiple losses upon multiple losses. And so they know that these kids have really, really gone through it. These families have really gone through it. And I think it's gonna be, you know, really up to the school community to like be a community, to be a safe space for them to land on and to really make the extra attempts to con to connect with them and to make sure they get the resources and the services that they need. Just to piggyback on what Sydney said about those resources, one of the, the best things that we need to do is we have to expand those community partnerships. We have to bring people in. We have the schools have to start opening those doors to those nonprofit organizations because the schools are they're spent. They have they're doing every possible thing they can. They need help. We need you know, this is when we're calling on our partners and our equity shareholders. This is when we are, you know, really maximizing those relationships and also bringing those in, but then also to being aware of new things that are coming out. There are children's books being written for children about police shootings and things like that. Um, one that comes to mind is I believe it's called Causing Good Trouble. Um, my daughter actually read it and she was at a fourth or fifth grade reading level at that time frame. So there are so many more books that can be implemented about it. There are all these different things that we can do if we actually start working together and not putting the whole load on our backs. And also saying sometimes, I don't know, I may not be qualified to have this conversation. Let me pull in the right people to discuss this. Okay. And I apologize, this, I don't know how long this is going to be going off. I keep waiting it out to think I'll have a chance to talk without it buzzing. But I mean, I do think that there's some really great points that have been made here. It's, you know, acknowledging if you aren't the best person to have those conversations and where to bring in those resources and how to, how to access those resources so that way your community's um, really got that diversity um, addressed and not pushing it under the rug. I think a lot of times, sometimes people are uncomfortable with conversations and they will push it under the rug. But if you're not comfortable with it, where can you find that comfort and where can you find that support to have that for your students? Because it is very real and um, we need to acknowledge that and make sure that we're addressing it. And if we're not the ones that are most comfortable, then where can we find those resources that, that people that are? And whether it be books or outside agencies and things like that, there's, there's a lot out there now, which is, is great. Uh, it's unfortunate that, you know, things have escalated to the extent they have, but I think that there's been a lot of positives that have come out of um, the awareness. Okay, so continuing in the discussion on last Thursday during our social justice town hall, one of our panelists, Waikisha Howe of Parent Avengers, um, talked about how her virtual learning experience and her kids' experiences was phenomenal. She has no complaints. She was engaged with the teachers. They love the experience and they're ready to roll back in school because of that positivity. But that's not the case for a lot of our Georgia kids, right? They, they absolutely struggle without that in-person support, particularly our special education kids. They did not have the, the one-on-one supports that they would normally have in the building because a lot of folks didn't feel comfortable going into the homes and there just were, were not enough resources, right? And so with all of that in mind and recognizing that a lot of students just did not have a great virtual experience, what can schools do to make sure that these students reacclimate in a supportive way other than the mental health supports and, and um, the social emotional learning piece, what else can be done to make sure that these students are hitting the ground running full steam ahead with supports in place. What do you know about what's going on in your districts and what else needs to be done? What else do you recommend? And I guess we can start with, uh, how about Dr. Karen? I am so sorry. I just messaged one of the assistant principals like, how long is this alarm gonna be going off? Um, I do think that there's a lot that needs to be done and, and to getting to, um, you know, pre-teaching, practicing, um, using, how are you gonna respond? How are you gonna use those words? What are you going to say if and when this happens to you? I think it's gonna be more of a when than an if. Um, I do think that, um, you know, we need to look at the why, if something's happening, why is somebody, you know, acting out rather than, 
I think we've talked about, you know, what's wrong with you versus what, what happened to you um, kind of verbiage. And I think it's just, you know, really stepping back to get a better sense of um, what is happening and, and why is it happening and how can we best support them rather than seeing it as just a, a punitive thing. And, and you know, pre-teaching and practicing, I think, is huge and modeling as well. Just to follow up on it, um, I think this is a great opportunity for parent engagement. First of all, I do know why you should howl. We used to sit on the PTA together many years ago. So I know why you should howl. But also too, um, with parent engagement, this is, a, this is a great opportunity for schools for data collection. This is where your surveys and your survey monkeys and you're sending those out to parents and you know rewarding students who come back with filled out surveys and really getting people signed up to really give you that information as soon as they're coming parents and communities are walking that door or when we're at that carpool line saying hey can you click on this link please scan this link and fill this information out we just really need to know how we can be better for your for your kids so that that's a definite opportunity for data collection And I think anecdotally too, I think, I mean, I know that anecdotally just think of my own kids who are a little head is hesitant about the in-person learning experiences. You know, they, they've been home with us for so long that there, there's a little anxiety around, around this, of what this is going to look like in that, in this, in this new frontier that we're, that we're all embarking on. And so having the conversation at home, I think helps, but then also letting them know that like, you know, school is a part of our community and it can be a safe space, giving them that space to like form those relationships with the teachers and letting the teachers know that like, you're going to have to enforce that like, this is this is this is your community. We we can be safe here. We can take the necessary precautions here. We are a team. We can do this together. Um, I think just some verbiage around that, letting them know that they can be part of this like buy-in and that that people in that building want them to succeed and be safe too. I think that could can go a long way as well. And leaning into to that point as well, leaning into noticing our kids, leaning into the fact that. Our kids can teach themselves academically online um, or through Siri or whatever the case might be. Um, why is it important for you to be here? Why do I want you here as a student in my classroom? Um, that's going to be what gets those learners who have been virtual, who may be hesitant um, to re-engage with us so that they can start to feel the benefit of that social interaction again. Um, one of the things that we talk about in Zeeks is that dopamine and oxytocin exchange that happens when we're in an in-person environment together. In the absence of that, our kids have learned to find answers to things on their own. When they feel the, the social rewards of being appreciated, recognized, noticed, I see that you're here, thank you for coming in today, that's going to help their dopamine production increase, which is going to send their brain a message that, hey, this is a good reward. I want more of this. And it will help reduce some of that anxiety, hopefully, and also build more resilient kiddos that are ready to learn when they come into the classroom. I think one of the things, too, that, um, you know, I know a lot of my districts talking about before and after school opportunities. When can you connect with teachers? Maybe not in the big classroom setting, but maybe if there are um, study sessions before school, after school, lunch times, things like that. Find ways to help those students feel like they are part of the school um, and engaging with those staff members in ways that aren't just as a big group of 20, 30, 40 sometimes students, depending on the size of the class. So, you know, taking those times to find those opportunities to connect because teachers do, you know, really want to be there for those students. They all chose this profession for a reason. And, and then accessing those different opportunities, I think, all helps you know, not being afraid to do that. Your children might say, no, I don't want to do that, or I'm embarrassed to do that. But I think the more that we can encourage them to be engaged and involved, the easier that transition back will be um, for that in-person learning. And use that technology. We have found things that worked from a technology perspective over the last year. So things like Google surveys or quick check-ins, lean into that technology to the extent that you can to give your students an opportunity to say how they are or let you know if they need some support without having to like be vulnerable and come to you face to face to ask for it. Um, we have a lot of great things that we can take away from the challenges of the last year that we can utilize going forward 
to help this reintegration process be a little bit easier. So. Thank you all. That was um, really great. Um, I want to turn to um, some feedback that we got from our town hall that we had last week on the pandemic and social justice. So we had some students on that um, town hall who were reporting that they had observed among their peers um, that incidences of racially motivated harassment had actually increased um, over the course of the pandemic when everybody was virtual and not seeing each other in person regularly. Um, and so the, the students were sort of positing that because they didn't see each other in person at school, there wasn't that accountability that you get as a result of proximity. And so that made it easier. As we all know, it's really easy to say something online. It's not so easy when the person is sitting right across from you in person, right? Um, and so we've also um, know of studies indicating that students are already forming some in-group and out-group identities around who was virtual, who came back in person, who's wearing a mask, who's not wearing a mask, you know, in those schools where um, it may be encouraged but not mandated. And so all of this, of course, leads to a concern that when we get everybody back in the building together, we're going to see some bullying, potentially, um, some other manifestations of that sort of um, division that the virtual nature, the virtual environment created. Um, so what can schools do to sort of proactively address the bullying that we may see coming out of these types of things? Um, and what can parents do to prepare their children for that as well? One thing that I've seen um, in schools, and I, and I always say this, and I have to keep this in the back of my mind, that culture um, kills strategy. So first of all, attacking the strategy, uh, the culture of schools is a big one. And as we know, principals create the culture of schools. So campaigns regarding this, engaging parents in this, making it, this is not just a cultural thing. This isn't something that we're doing. This is a school policy. This is a policy of whatever the policy is that we're enforcing that. And then also having, making parents buy into it. Like in order for your children to be here and have a successful time at the school, these are the things that we require of your students while they are on campus. So actually really holding these families accountable. Like, yes, we understand everybody has very different beliefs on what should or should not be happening, but this is what's going on in this building where we are. So understanding that this is what we have to follow that keeps everybody safe. And at home, really reflecting that idea that we are all in a team, regardless of what our opinions might be as adults, the students and the teachers are the ones who are creating that team inside the building. And so being mindful, again, of what we say and what our attitudes are around masks or virtual versus in-person learning, all of those things, because our kids are going to reflect that. Um, staying involved is going to be really important and always being prepared for the fact that change might happen. We don't know when a mask might, mandate might occur or um, there might be another quarantine that has to happen for whatever reason. Um, our kids are going to pick up on our attitudes and our kids are going to do what they see us say and do. And so if we can be mindful of ourselves as the adults and recognize there are adult conversations and there are not adult conversations, whether you have 15 year olds or five year olds in your home, um, there are just some things that you have to be aware impact everybody, um, especially in these communities and these schools where the masks particularly are not mandated, where they're strongly encouraged. Perhaps there's a family member at home, so a child does have to wear a mask. Um, just being aware we never know where anybody else is coming from and reminding our kids that and, and keeping this, like we're all kind of in this together. We have our own stuff, but we all have to come together and work at this together, because that's the only way we're going to actually get through any of it. Um, I witnessed some of this in-group, out-group stuff just during orientation walkthroughs in a high school um, this week, and it's very hard to see. And we need to be very aware, again, that those kids who are not speaking up, who are not, the lack of behavior is often an indicator that there is something amiss. And so 
just because a kid acts out doesn't mean that that's the one that's being bullied. We have to remember that perceptions are reality for our kids. If they are perceiving themselves to be in the out group, if they are perceiving that they are being teased or picked on or bullied, then that's their reality and it needs to be validated that they're feeling that way. Um, and that again, goes back to our adult modeling. And to speak to, you know, like you said, there might be, you know, vulnerable family members at home and, and, you know, having your children be able to feel comfortable saying, I have to wear a mask. I have a family member who is immunocompromised, whatever those words are that they need to feel to say that can shut down that bullying or shut down those comments. If it is related to a mask wearing situation, um, I think that, you know, we need to give those words to our kids. A lot of times if you're thrown these kind of situations, and not expecting it, our responses aren't necessarily as strong as if we have kind of that ready and, and um, response. And that is, it's valid and it's legitimate. And, and also, you know, again, that relationship building is huge. So if a child is feeling like these things are happening to them, who in the school could they go to? Who is it that they feel comfortable talking to? And having those conversations with your children as a parent to be like, you know, which teacher do you feel most connected to? Is there a staff member there? It could be, you know, one of the, um, sports or extracurriculars or anything like that that these these kids do so helping um, as a parent find that one person in your um, child's life that could be in the different environments where they are that they could go to and then as school staff members really identifying how can we be these mentors to these students how can we be the people that the kids would want to come to um, what kind of things could we do to help encourage that um, keeping an eye and ear out for those kids that might be the quiet ones that you're thinking nothing's wrong but it actually might be a lot going on that's wrong um, and it is a lot to, to put on, but I think if you form those relationships, some of that stuff just organically happens and it comes more naturally that the kids will come to you and you're also going to see it a little bit better because you're going to be more in tune to the kids in your building as well. So, you know, a couple different things there, but I think really focusing on that relationship piece, helping your children know the words to say, how to respond to it and where to go to get help if you do ha have it happening to you or see it happening to others. You know, there's a lot of research on bullying that even bystander, you know, um, watching things like that happen affects you emotionally almost as much as if it were actually happening to you. So teaching the kids that if you see something happening, how do we respond? This is the culture of our school. This is the team that we've created. We are looking out for each other. We are trying to, you know, be kind of, you know, one team in general. I think like Robin was saying before too, that whole mentality that we are all in this together. So um, creating that culture in your school where it feels like you're not telling on people, you're getting people support and getting people help and feeling comfortable doing that. And one other off if you guys could tell. <laughs> Concentrate okay. a little better now. I wanted to piggyback, sorry, again, on Dr. Schwartz, just really quickly, because this came up at our dinner table last night. Um, and my kids were all virtual and are now back going in person and have that anxiety around returning to school, as I know so many kids do. And the conversation was, well, what if I want to wear a mask just because, because it's voluntary in our district? What if I want to wear a mask because I just feel better? And we said, that's fine. And I, of course, do that. I mean, we want them to wear masks. But at the end of the day, we teach our kids very early on that they're responsible for saying, this is my body. I can do what's best for me with it. Um, and encouraging our kids that they don't have to have a reason to want to wear a mask. They don't have to have a reason to want to keep their peers safe or want to keep themselves safe. Um, I was listening to a child the other day who said, it's kind of, my mask is like a security blanket. I haven't been around that many people in a really long time. And so if I have my mask on, it just makes me feel better. Um, and those are the kinds of things that, that I think it's good for us to just acknowledge. There doesn't have to be a reason. There doesn't have to be a, a something you lean to. And we need to just honor that in our kids and in one another as well. I will say that we've been, I guess the mass discussion is happening at every single dinner table, right? Just across the board. Everyone's, it's because you've got kids, you're just kind of worried about it. And we have leaned into the, the role playing. It was like watching my daughter practice it of like, if someone asked her why she's wearing a mask and giving her some verbiage around it and like making her practice it, you could see, you could see like her efficacy changing at first. She was a little hesitant, but like, no, say it in your deep voice. 
from the pit of your stomach with a little base in it. You know, you could see that now she's prepared to kind of walk through the school in the hallways. And if someone asks her about it, she's prepared in her response, you know, and it changes your body language and the way you give the response. It changes how she felt about what she was going to say and how it was going to be received. And so I think that the role playing and giving them the words around that is, is really powerful. All great points, such great points. And with that, um, those conversations at the dinner table remind us that school has been home, right? And home has been school. And so a lot of the non-academic concerns that schools normally probably wouldn't discuss or take up have been at the planning table in school conference rooms, right? And so thinking about those non-academic challenges that the pandemic have brought forth to our students and without recognizing them, we might not have our students in the building or they might not be accounted for, right? So we're talking about um, those losses, those actual losses of loved ones or the recovery for those who struggle with COVID who are still with us. Um, income, housing, we, we've got a big weekend coming up, possibly, right? Um, with that housing security, even food security. We saw unprecedented meals go out. Every child in Georgia had free meals. That wouldn't have happened but for the pandemic, right? And so when we think about all those things and behavioral aids and other supports that normally wouldn't have anything to do with school directly, what are you all seeing? Um, those discussions around these other non-academic obstacles that could very well prevent kids from engaging fully in schools. How are schools preparing to support communities and families and students uh, around those non-academic issues and challenges as we ramp up for the school reopening. And I think I want to start with maybe Sydney and move into Jen and Karen and everyone else kind of just contribute to the conversation. What, what are school, what are you seeing schools do to prepare for those non-academic challenges that are sure to come? I mean, at the schools that we work with, they're, they're keenly aware that loss has been at the forefront of what our what the students and the families have been dealing with these past like 18 months. So it's again, it's that like trauma informed lens. It's like that grief and loss, like education, like what it can look like, how we can support, how do you build resiliency, not only in the student, but also in the family too, because they go back home to these larger systems, right? So how can you show up and be present in a way that um, can be there for the kids and, and, and the family? Um, and I know just, I mean, the housing stability, the food insecurity, I mean, we've, we've, had, we've had families who've really, really struggled. Um, and it's, 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 it's really a collaborative community effort to be there, to see what's needed, to plug in resources, to be present, to meet them where they are, and to give them the space that they need. I mean, I say grace, but when I say grace, I mean really patience and kindness, right? To help them navigate through this and be the support and the linkage to the resources that, that, that they need. Yeah. I read uh, somewhere earlier this week or late last week, 119,000 kids in the United States have lost a primary caregiver to COVID. And so those 119,000 kids, it's not just... Um, it's not just them, it's their peers who are going to be impacted by this. It's their, their financial situation Their The whole community is impacted when there's one loss, which we know, um, avoiding the blame game is going to be really important. Again, that parental modeling. And I think maybe I come at this from a, a different lens, but, um, we're seeing a lot of that now, even with some of the language around vaccinations versus non-vaccinations, et cetera, recognizing that we're all here in this situation. There is no one point of contact that we can say, here's your, this is your fault. It's on you. All we can do is bring our hands together and try to lift everybody up. Cause when we fight to raise one person, we're going to raise everyone. Um, and I know that sounds really probably kumbaya around a tree, but at the end of the day, we're all in this world together. We have to share it with each other. And so recognizing that while I may not have experienced a direct loss, I know somebody who did. And those kids in our classroom may know somebody who did or hear something about it. And maybe they feel different from their parents or they've overheard conversations about what's going to happen after Saturday. Where are we going to go? How are we going to get through this? Um, 
keeping an eye out on those kiddos that are quiet because maybe they were told to not say anything because there is a degree of, of shame and fear. Um, so just being aware and tapping in. And if you don't have the, the ability or the, the tools, it's okay to say, I don't know how to help. It's okay to tap into somebody and say, can you call, I have this situation. This is bigger than me and I can't deal with it. Let me see if I can find some resources. And I've been tapping into this panel for the last two weeks for some support. So, you know, if you don't have to know the answer or, or shoulder that burden, there are other places to get information, ask, um, because that not only is going to lighten your load, but it's also going to help model. Again, modeling is so important. It's going to help model to others that we can ask for help and get those things that we need, or at least get some answers to go in the right direction. I think from a school perspective, you know, collaborating, I think is a huge piece of it from, you know, we can't solve every problem, right? But the people seem to come to schools to solve almost every problem. And as social workers, we get calls all the time for things like, can you help pay my light bill? Can you help give me a computer? Can you help get me internet? Can you help me close the food or whatever? And, you know, the more that we can collaborate with the community around us and whether it be holding, um, you know, resource fairs or advertising ones that happen, helping get people to the right people, um, letting them know and normalizing that this is okay to not be okay. I think, um, you know, we're, we've all been in those situations before and this might be our season where we might need to get some more help and letting people know that it's, it's totally normal. So if you're bringing, again, um, I think I talked about before, finding where the people are and where you can meet them the best where they're at is going to help them um, feel more comfortable accessing those resources or asking for help. I think I heard on the news yesterday that um, of all the housing money that's been allotted to help with the, the evictions, um, only 10% has been used. So there's millions and millions and millions of dollars out there that the states are having trouble getting it into the hands of the people that need it. So, you know, increasing that awareness of not being afraid to go to these agencies and saying, hey, I need help, or, or you know, what is the barrier to getting that help for these families to uh, maintain some stability in their homes? And, you know, from the school standpoint, you have the homeless education program through the um, you know, those resources might be the ones that know best where to get that extra support, or the social workers might be the ones to, to work with different um, faith-based organizations to get resources um, to families in need, whether it be the food in the backpacks on the weekends or clothing or, or those types of things. So not being afraid to ask if you don't know the answer, somebody there at the school is going to know the answer. And, and as school systems, just normalizing that it's okay that these resources are out there how can we let families know that they're out there and how can we help connect them to those resources out there? Just picking back on what Jen said and Dr. Karen said, those community engagement, it's so important in this space and also those partnerships and leveraging those partnerships because that's where the, the extra help and support is really gonna go, really really building that that space so that parents can get social connections made, but then also just helping support parent resiliency. So that is something that I've heard all three of you ladies actually discuss, and it's so important in how we're communicating, but also not deciding what your community needs and just saying this is what they need, but actually having those conversations and asking them what they need, because we'll find that we might be giving them things they do not want. So we need to ask. I think that was a great point, Robin, you made earlier about the, you know, using surveys, using opportunities in the carpool line, fill this out. And, and again, not assuming that people need this, but even if it's an anonymous way that they can let people know that they need it um, or voluntarily let, you know, put their name out there. But I like the idea of, of pulling those um, questions for people to feel comfortable asking and utilizing that technology in such a way that the information's out there. We just have to ask and then we can a lot of times get it. Um, I see somebody put in the chat about Clayton County Schools sending out the resource list for um, emergency eviction and prevention utility support to their um, school and parent email list. And I think those kind of opportunities, um, we are more in tune to looking at our devices, so let's use those. So whether it be through text, through Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is, like, you know, we, uh, 
at the schools try to figure out what's the best way to reach the kids. So Instagram might be the best way for the kids, and Facebook might be the best way for parents. So again, those surveys and those questions ask, what way would you want to be reached, and what are you going to respond to the most? The kids are not going to look at the email, but the parents might. You know, So figuring out those ways to, to let people know what's out there, but you've got to also figure out the best way to, to um, reach them so they're aware of it. So, and one place in which we see sort of barriers in reaching families, um, and this existed before the pandemic, but I think the pandemic has exacerbated it in many ways, is um, immigrant families or families with limited English proficiency. Um, I'm sure all of us have encountered issues with families that, um, where maybe the parents don't speak English, um, communicating with them, understanding what's needed, linking them to resources where they're going to be able to explain what's going on. Um, in the language that they use. Um, and so also there can be concern about engaging with school officials um, if maybe there's some undocumented immigration status and impact that that might have. Um, and so what can sort of all of us in the community, community partners, schools, parents, um, do to help those students and their families access the types of resources we've been discussing? One of the things that I think is super helpful is to engage, um, you know, people from those different cultures to connect with those families. I think, you know, we go back to, you know, maybe I'm not the best person to do this, but who in my community would be the best person to reach out to that? We've got a great organization here in, in Cobb County um, that, you know, really knows how to reach out to some of our Hispanic families and they, you know, culturally make them, you know, have the ability to connect with um, these families in a way that doesn't feel threatening, doesn't feel like they're going to be deported, doesn't feel like if they share information it's going to be used against them. Um, I know families in the past have been afraid to fill out the free and reduced lunch forms just because they think this is an agency and this is the government and they're going to find out things. So how can we find those community partners to um, connect with those families um, to be able to connect on their, on their, in their language and, and culturally I think is a really big important piece of it. Um, and acknowledging that it's real and their fear is real and they're, you know, not diminishing it and saying, oh, no, nothing's going to happen. You don't need to worry about it because that their, their perception is the reality. Even if we know filling out a free and reduced lunch form is not going to cause them um, any concerns for deport deportation, um, they might feel differently. And that's their perception. That's the reality. So we need to really... I think utilize those resources in our community, whether they be through faith-based organizations or different agencies that um, connect with the different, you know, culturally sensitive and things like that, that we can help those families feel less threatened by um, how accessing these resources could be, you know, helpful for them and not, not scary for them. I think it's always important, um, but particularly when we're dealing with families of English language learners, a couple of things. Number one, assume competence but also maintain um, that cultural sensitivity. So recognize that while you may be interacting with a parent or bringing in a translator and the parent or caregiver is nodding their head or saying yes, that doesn't necessarily mean that they actually understand. Sometimes it's just a politeness and a respect and a reflection piece. Um, number two, when we have kiddos, this is a community that I try really hard to support. And so when we have kiddos where the children in the home are primarily responsible for translation, it's important to also just be aware of that because it doesn't mean the message is always getting to the parents or caregivers in the same way. Um, one of the things that I'm learning is that this concept of um, what does it mean to be required to attend school is very different uh, for some of our families of English language learners. And that's particularly where the Truancy Intervention Project comes into play because um, it's not something that is compulsory in other in all other countries. It's not something that is regularly enforced across um, different geographic areas. And so just being aware of the fact that you can give information, but that doesn't mean that it's actually getting through is really, really important. Um, further alienating or trying to utilize putative um, responses is not going to engage your families. Um, we've got to flip the switch a little bit, try to find a different code switch, if you will, find a different way to communicate and engage. Okay. 
And, and, and it makes so much sense and uh, making sure that that those language barriers aren't stopping these kids from fully accessing. And in that, that same regard, I want to shift a bit to um, school climates, right? We all hope that our kids experience a positive school climate. No one wants to voluntarily send their child in a space where there'll be negative climates of any sort. And so recognizing the school climates and, and building them in a positive way pose their challenges. I don't think that that discussion can happen without recognizing the ever-present disparities as it relates to certain student groups, uh, particularly Black students, um, LGBTQ, LGBTQIA plus students, um, students experiencing poverty, students with disabilities, um, brown students, and a host of others, right? Some of which we don't collect data from. So that, that's something that we have to come to terms with as well. But in recognizing that these kids will be returning um, with a lot of collective and complex trauma having happened over the past almost um, two years, essentially, how do we make sure that schools aren't responding in a punitive way to really what's typical responses to trauma? There might be some, some behaviors and we know that that's communication of one way or the other, it's communication. How do we make sure that schools and districts are responding in an appropriate way to what really could be just trauma manifesting and behaviors that could typically be considered um, bad behavior or discipline issues when in reality it might just really be trauma responses. What can schools do to try to safeguard against over um, disciplining kids that just need some supports and help? And I guess I'll start with Robin on this one and we'll move into the rest of the panel members. I think for this one, uh, for me, um, I love this question so much just because having a deeper understanding of what disparity really is, I think is the very first step, but then also not only just having a deeper understanding of what disparity is, actually understanding that sometimes our communities may not even realize that they're experiencing disparity, but then also may not even be able to verbalize their disparities. So addressing these issues, it's going to be a very slow and step-by-step -step process because as we know with disparity and discrimination, that there's so many microaggressions in both that when we're having these discussions that there, it, it literally is mostly us asking questions and really diving deeper into what is considered disparity. Like what are we asking of these communities and what are we asking for parents and children to do? And what if this family community is a family, most of these families don't even have cars. What if we're asking these, what are we asking all these kids to pack on the bus and bring to us on the first day of school? What are we, you know, all these small little disparities like that that are just real small things that we could be asking that don't seem like much to us, but the processes in which these parents have to go through in order to be able to get those. But then also remembering too, that abuse went up during COVID. That was something abuse went up. So Working with DFACS, I saw quite a bit of those cases that were increased because of COVID. So how are we addressing and making sure that we're having those conversations about healthy ways to express anger, healthy ways to express emotion and all those things so that they can understand that there is a disparity in, in, in their space. Seeking to understand on the front end is it is going to be really important as well. So one of the things that we talk a lot about with seeks is get a pulse on your kiddos as they're coming into the classroom. Just try to find a way that they can simply and discreetly let you know where they are. Because if you're looking across the room and you see that you have over half of the kids in your class are in the green, the red zone or the yellow zone, you know that there you may need to adjust. And it's much better to respond than react. If you can respond to that information you've gotten back, then you're going to be able to create a, a climate and a community that is supportive and less punitive because you're already going to know you're not forcing something when it's not going to be successful. Um, we, we talk with administrators too, just like about small little like incremental changes. Like for example, like I was working with one of the schools and instead of having a tardy slip the kid had to take to class, could, instead of it saying tardy, could it just say, we're so glad you made it? It's just the little things like that, that like makes a school an inviting place 
for kids to be, right? It's not, doesn't need to look like an institution, but just it's got to look like somewhere that they're going to have fun when they walk in the building, like smiling, glad you made it, missed you yesterday, you showed back up. Those little things go a really far away with the little kids, with the, with, with the little, they, they go far away with me. I mean, I like to go to places where I feel welcome. Why is it any different for little people? <laughs> so just those little things I think can, can go a far way. It'll go far with the middle schoolers and high schoolers too. I mean, so many of our kids were so far behind um, academically when they transitioned to virtual school because they didn't have that technology and resources. And we were really supportive of that then, you know, when we had kids that had just struggled to get up, get caught up from that. Um, helping the kids, especially those middle schoolers and high schools who are more prone to self-imposed truancy, if you will, um, be aware that, you know, Hey, you're here and we're just glad you're here. will ease so much anxiety from them that show up anxiety, that anticipatory anxiety of what's going to happen when I walk in, if I haven't been here for a week. Um, so that's a great point, Sydney. I actually wrote it down. So thanks. <laughs> And again, there's a lot of research that shows those connections and those relationships all decrease discipline issues at schools and they improve grades at schools and they improve attendance at schools. So there can't be enough said about the need for that connection and really understanding our students and understanding and 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 showing interest in them and they're going to share. You know, I think the high schools are a little less likely to share a lot of times. So it can be a little bit harder where the, the little ones might tell you what's going on at home and the older ones might not. But there can't be enough said about that relationship building um, because the research really does point to how discipline, attendance, grades are all you know improved when you have a school culture where those kids feel connected. They feel like they're wanted. They feel like we're excited you're here today, you know, rather than you're too bad you're late. You know, you're going to be marked down for that and that kind of thing. So, um, you know finding those little ways to just even the simple little verbiage that you use um, to help kids feel connected and you know you know rather than oh finally showed up today it's like oh wow I've missed you it's so great that you're here it's like you know little things like that and that does change the dynamics for those kids no matter who you are and and you know you do want to go places where you're liked more and and that's just natural human instinct um, so how can we form those relationships because those other things will naturally improve um, the data does really support that And I just want to add um, one piece um, about that supportive structure, right? That consistency. If we start something, we got to keep it going. I remember when I was a classroom teacher and I, I did 6 through 12 during the day and my high school students, I used to put a small sticker if you had a B on an assignment and a large sticker if you had an A. And if I forgot that sticker, <laughs> those kids will lose it. I'm talking about 18 year olds and they were like, what's Woods? Where's my sticker? Like they were serious about it because it was a recognition. It wasn't necessarily out loud, but it was personal to them. And that consistency meant so much to them. And I think that in some weird way, that sticker caused them to even perform or, or take things seriously just because I recognize them and value them. And just that supportive structure because all kids need and want structure. But if it's supportive in nature and engaging and consistent, they're going to perform for you the same way you perform for them. So I just wanted to um, add that tidbit <laughs> in support of everything you all have said so far. Well, and I think sometimes, too, as educators, we forget that that reinforces us, right? I think Jen talked about the dopamine and how that reinforces us to want to do things more often. So, you know, the more that we might feel like, oh, it's an extra step, I have to remember to do this for my kids. But when you get that positive reinforcement from your the kids, like, hey, where was that note? Then it makes you feel good and wants you to do it again, and you're not going to want to forget that, to do it again, right? So I think we all need to remember it might seem like a chore. I know sometimes the, the social emotional things like that um, Jen's talked about trying to teach teachers one more thing that you have to do. It's not necessarily one more thing you have to do. It actually can be really reinforcing for you and um, help kind of you feel better about your job and feel better about what you're doing as an educator as well. So trying to reframe it a little bit is not you know, always easy, but I think the more that you engage in those kind of things, the more you're going to feed off of it and find that positive from your own self as, you know, in the school system, um, not just for the kids, but for yourself. So we have about 15 minutes left in the panel, and we want to be sure that there's time for folks either watching on Facebook or on the Zoom to ask questions. Um, so please 
submit questions, you can post them in a comment on Facebook. We have folks checking that. Um, or go ahead and put it in the chat or the Q&A here. Um, and while you're doing that, um, I'm going to exercise some moderator's prerogative and ask a slightly different question. Um, so I love to go to panels and participate in panels where I walk away with concrete tips. And so I kind of wanted to expand on what you all were just talking about um, and make some space for folks to give sort of concrete small these small tips and tricks to kind of tweak school culture so what other things like sydney talked about changing the tardy slip to the we're so glad you're here slip um i know that in um, our office has adopted one of the sanctuary institute practices of community meeting where at the beginning of every meeting we have a check-in with everybody and it's a really good way of knowing where everybody on our staff is emotionally so that then it's like today's not a good day to ask about this thing we're going to say because that's not where they are right um and so jen i know you mentioned something with popsicle sticks and taking the temperature so i would love for you all just to share with you know our audience of educators what are some things that they can do sort of practices that they can try to implement even next week to make some of those um tweaks to school climate i'm a huge advocate for the check-in so where are you how are you feeling today it can be something as simple as an emoji that a kid might um you could do it on your door elementary school kids are really happy to to put their name where they are in a, a zone or next to an emoji um, older kids you can do a check-in via google docs or google forms just so that you can get a pulse where are you are how are you feeling do you need to talk to me what that does is it lets the students know that you see them and it gives you an opportunity to be responsive as the teacher and um, it doesn't have to be an all the time or an everyday thing another thing that we talk about when we're discussing quick wins for re-entering school is visual supports lots of visual supports because there's so much stimuli coming at all of our kids. Um, some of our kids are so used to learning virtually with a ton of noise in the background. So a quiet classroom might be a little bit harder for them to reintegrate from a sensory perspective into. So what are some other things that we can do to help support that? Visual supports. Um, and just recognizing the fact that for those kids who were virtual all last year and those teachers who were used to teaching virtually, they saw feet, foreheads, and fans. Um, and what I mean by that is not only, you know, were they literally just here up, but also kids are used to, if they've been virtual or they've been in and out of school, they might be used to not wearing socks and shoes while they're learning. They might be used to having free access to the fridge or rolling around on a bed or, um, I was coaching a teacher and there was a naked kid running across the back in a virtual class one time. I just, so we need to be mindful of that as well as we have these diverse experiences coming in. The diversity of our kids' needs has also changed. So just recognizing that if a kid's really fidgety, that might just be something that they need some help self-regulating, giving kids a chance you can stand up and blue tape outside your chair if you need a minute simple quick and easy quick win you can take away and it will help alleviate some behavior concerns that might show up in your class sorry that was more than one thing sarah i just want to jump in i guess on the moderator privilege as well um <laughs> i think that a lot of the decisions that are going on right now are being done in isolation of the students and the multi-agency alliance for children mac that works with a lot of um foster care agencies and other advocates in that realm, their motto is nothing for us without us when it comes to the youth in care. And so really engaging them on building those expectations and responsibilities as soon as they get into the classroom day one. When you own it, it becomes real to you. So I think that whenever possible, pull them in on that planning side because we have been making a whole lot of decisions, albeit hopefully in the best way we can without them. But I think a recurring theme with our two youth panelists on last week was that they want their voices heard on different levels. And so whenever possible, pull them in into the expectation and responsibility setting. You don't even have to say rules, right? You got a language, right, Doc? Um, <laughs> we got to pull them in in a meaningful way and make sure that whatever's being done for them and around them involves them. I think that's something important to take away. I feel like one of the things, too, is we focus so much on, um, you know, academics. I think as educators, how can you use this first week 
um, in terms of creating that culture in your classroom, setting those expectations, having their buy into whatever it is. Create a theme in your classroom so when the kids come in, I mean, whether it's a color or whether it's your favorite sports team or whether it's your favorite place to go visit, creating a theme where the kids feel like, you know, it's, it's identifying and it's connecting and having them, you know, share something about what, what culturally might be um, cool for them to share. And, and taking this first week, rather than jumping right into, we need to start back and figure out where you left off with math and where you left off with reading, how can you take this first week, at least 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning of your class for, for five days in a row, if you spend that time just creating that culture in your room, it's going to take you through the entire year in a different way than if you jump right in with, we need your parents to fill out these forms, we need to have you you know, go through the process of this is where you line up, and this is where you do this, and this is where you do that. And then, you know, the academics will come. And, and just, I think, as teachers recognizing and educators recognizing that, take a breath, you don't have to jump in right away. With that academic piece, it will serve you all so much better to take 10 or 15 minutes at the beginning of every day for at least that first week when school starts to get to know your kids and have them get to know you. Kids love hearing stories about, you know, us as adults and, you know, they, you know, they, they, they were actually human and the things have happened to us too and, and that can go a really long way. So feel like what, what are you comfortable sharing? What is it that you would want them to know about you? And whether it be something, like I said, a theme in your classroom um, and, and any kind of, like I said, color team, whatever it is, place to visit. Um, favorite food, whatever it is, and then have them pull those things in too, so that way it feels like a collaborative process, that it's not just a one-way street. I think a lot of times as educators, we're like, what's your favorite food? And, and they don't necessarily share your favorite food, right? So like, how can we make that more like that feeling of team, that feeling of collaboration, that feeling of buy-in, that we all want to get to know each other? Um, and it makes you more human and relatable. So I think just try to think of that first week and how can you in your mind structure it so it's really forming those relationships from the get-go. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. It's like it's, it's forming those connections and relationships really builds a foundation for the community that you're creating, right? And if you have their buy-in for like whatever the, the limits and the regulations and conditioning with the sharing and the connectivity, then you're creating the community. And so then you have you have them being able to participate it, to set the limits in it. It's just, it's, it's, that, it's that, that building, that foundation that could really carry you through the whole school year. I think one of the ways as well too, that I kind of heard everybody mention a little bit, but also just constantly at every turn as we're creating these learning experiences, asking ourselves the question, how is this creating an environment that is diverse and inclusive at the same time in every process and every turn? but then not only also utilizing that creativity. I don't think I know anybody more creative than educators because you guys have to do so much with so little. So creating fun ways to assess students level, like, you know, you guys have all these great games, Kahoot, I learned from you guys so much, so many educational tools, but using that to assess children because there's no way you guys can create an educational plan for your classrooms right in the beginning anyway because you don't know where everybody is at all when they're coming into your classroom so getting the assessments for these kids and knowing where they are but doing it in a way where they maybe don't even realize you're assessing them educationally so that we're not bringing on that anxiety um, is probably the, the best place to start uh, there was a question it looks like from facebook and that question is, and we have resources coming in from some of the attendees. I wanna make sure I um, give a shout out to the community schools um, who definitely work to support students and the APEX program, those school-based mental health supports that are coming through and definitely um, check with your school to see if that service is available to your students. Our question from Facebook is, um, I'm interested in knowing more about macro level efforts you all see for future youth. Um, an example of funding dedicated to anti-racism and LGBTQ affirming teaching and how you all might suggest folks address these recent attacks on critical race theory and gender in classrooms. I'm just gonna real quick before the panelists address it, suggest that as we continue to build on school climate and positive uh, behavior intervention and supports, we start to really look at it from an identity lens because while um, suspension rates and other outcomes have gone down in Georgia, the disparity rates remain, right? So we have to start really taking a closer look at these identity groups and seeing how 
the subjective response to these students, because in a lot of cases, the, the referrals are very subjective in nature, um, are affecting their outcomes and their opportunity to access their education fully. And so one of my, my recommendations is to um, really start looking at things from an identity lens, racial lens, um, gender, sexual orientation lens, and really, really honing in on what can be done differently in support of those students. So I'll just open it up to the panel. I think this is a really great but also very loaded question and it, it's very politically um, difficult to always um, answer in a way that is going to be um, accepted by the school board much less the uh, community so I will say that going into it I think one of the things and I keep bringing up data but I think one of the things that we need to utilize is data so if we look at like the Georgia Student Health Survey and I think we can probably put the link um, in here as well at some point if you just go Google Georgia Student Health Survey so it breaks it down by district it breaks it down by school grade level things like that and it asks some really great questions about how the students are dealing with different things um, I, I think that if we can look at how are students feeling impacted by bullying by race issues by feeling um, ostracized whether it be through you know the, the racism issues or um, gender identity and things like that, then we can use that data to, to help um, our school administrators and higher ups recognize that this is a need that needs to be addressed. I think if we just try to approach it from a notional standpoint and we know this is the right thing to do and we know that these kids need to be um, you know, addressed in a way and not brushed under the rug, you're not going to necessarily get anywhere. I think if we can use the data to support that these children are struggling, we know they're higher risk for suicide, we know that they're higher risk for depression, anxiety, things like that. The data is there, and so how can we pull that in to really speak to the higher ups to ex it, help them understand that this not only is impacting them social emotionally, it's impacting them academically, right? Like that, that's a lot of times where we hear that you know, our schools are looking at those numbers. How are they doing in math? How are they doing in reading? So we need to speak their language to get their buy-in, if that makes sense. So I think the more that we can use data to help support what we know is best practice um, to help students in need um, in these different, you know, diversity issues and inclusion issues, um, then we might have a little bit more success in making some headway, if that makes sense. Anyone else want to speak to the macro ways folks can deal with some of these issues and inclusion efforts? Parent roundtable discussions. The LGBT piece is not included in this the surveys. I think that's something that we should be advocating for, but also um, in looking at you know the bullying rates and things like that, um, we can pull some data from that as well. But yes, absolutely, we need to be advocating for that to be added. Um, for sure, because there's just no excuse for it not to be there. <laughs> it's a big piece. Well, since we are almost at the end of our time, um, I wanted to have a sort of a final question for each of the panelists, um, sort of what your final thoughts are on what, you know, sort of anyone listening in today. So schools, educators, districts, administrators, parents, community members, caregivers, um, what can all of us do to advocate for and create um, a climate for 100% engagement from our students? I think we can agree that we all want all of our kids to be fully engaged um, as they're starting up a new school year. So what can we sort of concretely be doing, each of us in our own role, um, to make that happen? And so I'll go in reverse alphabetical order, if that's okay. So that would be starting with you, Robin. Patience. I think that will be the first process. Rome was not built in a day and we are rebuilding an educational system with totally different rules now. So I think patience and consistency, because I think those are the only two things that we're going to be able to really do. And also open communication. If it's not working, our processes, please say it's not working. Don't sit in silence so that we know when to pivot. And then also remembering to create policies and procedures that have the ability to pivot so that if it isn't working, we can move in a different direction. So I think those are the things that we need to keep in mind. Karen, do you wanna weigh in? 
I mean, going back to what we've been mentioning a number of times, too, is that whole relationship building and the connection. So whether it be as a parent or a school um, member or caregiver, whomever it is, more you can form connections with people, the more resiliency they have, the more strengths that they have, um, and the better they're going to be. So, you know, how can we form those connections? Like I said before about, you know, sharing different stories about yourself or um, creating that culture in, in your classroom. Um, I think those are the things, I mean, we're definitely going to be flexible, we're definitely going to need to be pivoting, we're going to need to just kind of go into it with the expectation that things are probably going to change, so don't get too caught up in that rigid sense of this is how we do things, this is how we always do things. We need to be open and, and honest about, um, you know, that this the future is unknown, um, but the more that we can form those relationships, the more we're going to be in touch with what those needs are that um, we might need as educators and parents and students all together. Thank you. Sydney? I mean, just to just to echo what um, you know, Dr. Karen and Robin have said, it's just, you know, patience, kindness, connectivity to form the community that really is a place that the students want to be, whether it's virtually or in person, to create that sense of community where they feel like they belong and they want to be participants in that. And that is, it's, 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 it starts with patience, it starts with kindness, it starts with human connectivity, it starts with the buy-in that you're part of something that we need you there, because without you being there, we're not the same, you know? It's, it's, it's community building. So, yeah. Awesome. And Jen? Yeah, absolutely. Everything that everybody before me said, and just also recognizing that we're not just looking compliance. Um, what we want is for people to want to be there or to be noticed when they are. Um, so if we can look past just the compliant pieces, um, I think that we'll get into that, that we're tapping into our core kindness and connectedness and all of those things. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here um, and for speaking on the panel. This was a tremendous discussion and really a charge to all of us listening, um, whatever role we play in the education system, um, to be thoughtful um, and to employ some of these strategies as we go forward to make sure that the kids really are um, in a position where they can be learning. So um, Caroline, LaShonda, anything final from you all? Just thank you for joining us in this discussion. Um, again, if you are a Fulton County resident or you want to receive the follow-up information, please email us at info at gaappleseed.org. We hope to see you on September 2nd um, at 6 p.m. And have a great beginning of the school year. We wish you much success. And we hope that you reach that 100% attendance rate and engagement. Thanks for coming, y'all.